I think it's time for Johnny to ask this question about the champion of the people. Johnny. Yes. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I did some research on you, Gloria. I saw that you've traveled multiple times to Venezuela and you're even pictured with Hugo Chavez. Can you tell us about your work there? You know, uh, was Chavez a, a dictator or was he a champion of the people, of the indigenous people? Did he have support from the people? Well, God, thank you for that question. I also met many times with Fidel Castro. If you look, <laughs> wow. you'll, if you look you'll find pictures of me with him, who yeah. is, my, is one of my heroes in my life and hero to many tens of millions of people in the world. I think many more than that. And Hugo Chavez this too. He was a hero for me. I've also known Nicolas Maduro, the current president, since I met him in two, the year 2000. But and when he was a bus driver, I talked a few minutes ago about dictatorship because dictatorship is thrown around a lot. Oh, Fidel was always a dictator and Putin's a dictator and uh, the Soviet, Union, Soviet leaders were dictators. And uh, certainly Hugo Chavez was a dictator and Nicolas Maduro is a dictator. But you can't use those words without saying, for which class? And I would say rather, the dictatorship of capitalism could be put in another way, capitalist democracy, dollar democracy, where the landlord has a right over the tenant, where the capitalist has a right over the worker and can fire them when they want. That's the, that's the democracy of the capitalists. The democracy of socialism is that the working class is in power on behalf of all the population, intellectuals, everybody, the farmers, the workers. And so when you are in a workers' democracy of Cuba and what they have in Venezuela, Venezuela is different though because Venezuela is still primarily a capitalist country, but in a struggle for socialism. Right. We haven't been able to completely have a, a complete revolution but the unique part of Venezuela, it's very unique in terms of revolutionary history, is that the president is socialist, the Supreme Court is socialist, the military has been socialized. Uh, after the coup that was defeated under Chavez, the military was revamped and purged of the coup plotters that were working with the U.S. So it's a military that, as an example, to prove that, in 2019, last year, when the U.S. tried to in invade the country with their supposed humanitarian aid, and I was on that border at that moment. I went there to Venezuela, took a 25-hour trip to the border, and witnessed it and made video from it. But anyway, the U.S., remember Trump said, you have one last chance to the Venezuelan military to defect, or you will regret it for the rest of your lives. He said that literally, and we'll give you money and so on. Maybe some 300 defected out of a, you know, more than a million soldiers. And the militias of now 4 million people, the civilians in militia, who are determined, you know, we may have a hard time right now, but we're going to defend our country from U.S. imperialism. It's been a process of education of the population. Hugo Chavez, I wrote about him. I have a long biography of him in an article when he died. But Hugo Chavez was from the roots of the poorest people of the country. And when he became a military man, he was two weeks older than me, by the way. We were all children of the 60s and the 70s. And he was influenced by you know, the revolutionary movement of Cuba. In the military, he formed a secret group of soldiers. And his view was, we can't live like this anymore. Because he was a poor person and he was for justice. So he took on the military in 1992 that night when he surrendered after one day of battle with his men, he went on TV and said, I take full responsibility. We were trying to bring justice to the population, but we have to stop for now. And I'll tell you, the people who were alive at that time said, for now, he said, for now. He was in prison, but the president was forced to give him amnesty after two years. How do you do that? Was it a good president? Or was it the masses were demanding it? The masses were following Chavez. Here he is, a poor man, a soldier, unknown to the population. But that one act that he did in taking on the government, he became a national hero and became president. So what happened with Chavez's presidency was the greatest shock to the United States since the Cuban Revolution. Because the, U, the, the Venezuelans are sitting on the largest source of oil in the world. I was just recently at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. I was doing research there. And you look into the post-World War II, look at the CIA dis undis I mean, disclosed documents that show that one of the main countries they were worried about was Venezuela because they had the largest amount of oil. They recognized it then. And so the U.S. had the CIA fully embedded in Venezuela until Chavez's victory. It's why they 
try to overthrow him three years later. It's why they sabotage the oil industry and shut it down for five months. It's why they've been trying over and over. It's why they stole all of Venezuela's oil in the United States, the Sitco properties. It's why 14, 14 European and U.S. imperialist banks hold all the gold of Venezuela and refuse to release it. And then they give us pictures in the New York Times and say, oh my God, they're starving. Oh my God, they have no medicine. And they have these trumped up staged photos. And I've been in, Cuba, I've been in Venezuela 16 times since Hugo Chavez's victory. And I'm a videographer, I'm a journalist. And I have talked to many people. And I'll tell you, they're ready, they're ready to defend their country no matter what. But the danger of assassination of Nicolas Maduro is very great. The danger of U.S. invasion and the danger of all the paramilitaries that are right now hidden in different parts of the country. And in Colombia, that, that fascistic President Duque, who is doing everything he can to help overthrow the Venezuelan revolution because yeah. he fears for his own country what that example could mean. Yeah. And I'm just saying this, it's a long explanation, but Obama, again, was the first one to apply the, the sanctions, declaring yeah. Venezuela a national security threat yep. in March 2015. And so it's not the president, it's not the man or the woman, it's not the president, it's not the party, it's the system, it's capitalism, it's imperialism. So I just have a follow up on that really quickly. Um, uh, Latinos, who a lot of them, who came from Cuba, who came from Venezuela, who come from Latin America, are somehow entirely against communism. So this is a question more so for my father, who might be watching, who's against communism <laughs> in, its, in its entirety. Um, what, what, what do you say, what is your opinion on, on how a lot of the Cuban Americans, the Venezuelan Americans, other Latin Americans are so against the idea of communism that they can't talk about it and they say, well, I live there, I know what it's like, you don't want that. What do you say to those people? Well, they should look at my videos of uh, interviewing <laughs> Venezuelans on the ground in Venezuela from their own voices. So they're very powerful. But I say this about Venezuela in particular right now. Yeah. <clears throat> Up until now, and still today, 99.9% .9 of Venezuelans in the U.S. are people with money. Uh, some people with a lot of money. Yep. And of the upper middle class, if you can afford to fly to, Venice, to the U.S. from Venezuela and pay for your child to go to school, you are very wealthy. And that's what a lot of them are. I went on a national tour last year after I came back from that month being in Venezuela during the big U.S. aggression including five days of the blackout I was there. And I went on a tour of 50 cities in the U.S. And almost everywhere, Venezuelans would come to try to disrupt, uh, threaten, break it up. And they were almost all entirely youth who were studying in the U.S. or wealthy families. And um, poor Venezuelans don't live here. Maybe a handful, but not really. And in Cuba, the, the, the hundreds of thousands who left Cuba at the time of the revolution in the first two or three years were absolutely the ruling class. They were the bourgeoisie, they were the landowners, they were the bankers, they, were, they owned all the capital. The U.S. owned all the capital, they were the junior partners. And so of course they were against it. But the demographics in Miami, the largest population of all, has changed greatly. Your father's Latino, I presume. I don't know if he's from yeah. the U.S. or, yeah. or what. But, but the, thing, the thing about the Latino community is that the Spanish media, which <laughs> yeah. most Latinos who speak primarily Spanish in the U.S. listen to Spanish radio. And the Spanish radio is very right-wing when it comes to international politics. And people like Jorge Ramos, oh. the Univision reporter, who's just horrific. He's pro-immigrant, <laughs> but he's really anti-Cuba. And he's, he's also a liar, by the way. Big time liar. Yeah. When it comes to Cuba and Venezuela, he's created a lot of false narrative. But anyway, he, the Latino community listens to that and they go, but he says, but he says, and he's for immigrant rights. This is some of the challenges we have in the media. I, yeah. I want to tell you, I visited four prisons in Venezuela while I was there. I had this great privilege and I got into those prisons, men and women, and the transformation, the radical transformation, humanization of the inmates is dramatic. It happened under Chavez. It began under Chavez, but most of it was under Maduro. And these prisoners themselves talked to me alone or in groups and they'd say, it was a horror, it was a nightmare. And Chavez and Maduro made it different for us. I wish I could share a video to you right now of one of those inmates who says, I wish the US would just let us be. Because Chavez, she goes, it, first she goes, first it was God, then it was Simon Bolivar, 
then it was Chavez, and now it's President Maduro. And these are words of people who are in prison. And mm. as far as Cuba, no one can deny that the blockade has been absolutely severe against the people of Cuba. And since the 90s, when the Soviet Union collapsed and they faced the greatest test of all of the Cuban revolution, and it survived. It survived two U.S. laws that just almost strangled the population. And many people left during that time on the rafts. They weren't fleeing political repression. They were fleeing a difficult situation. But 11 million people stayed in their country and rebuilt it to being a, a social powerhouse with thousands of doctors around the world providing health care for free, saving people from the COVID. The, the, the marvels that they've created of almost 100% literacy, and not just literacy, but intelligent understanding of the world that they live in.